think, helpful mature material as we go through this. You remember in last week's study, we learned that God sometimes prompts people to do something contrary to what would be normal human behavior so that they can voluntarily give themselves to meet the needs of God's people. And we saw that in the example of the Israelites or the Egyptians as they helped Israel. Um, in the word of God says the Israelites plundered them, but the Bible indicates that they gave freely and uh, God said that that would happen. He had told Moses. And then we also saw the king of Persia who was voluntarily moved by God to uh, help the Israelites get back to Israel from Babylon and then also build the temple and build the walls. And so um, we saw that. Tonight we're going to look at another side to God's sovereignty over people and when necessary, God restrains people from decisions or actions that would harm God's people. And since you and I are some of God's people, that applies to us. And I want us, as we go through this, to always make the obvious application that these truths of God's sovereignty apply to us. Before we do, let's just pray and ask God's blessing on it. Lord, may you help us tonight. May you help me. I pray that what is said will be clear and what, it, what is said will be, Lord, what you want us to hear tonight. And I pray most of all that you would help us to make application to our lives specifically. Lord, whether we need this right at this point in our lives, at, at least of some uh, circumstance, we know that we will need it regularly as we go through life. And so it's a very important topic that you've given us tonight. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll start out with this matter of God restraining people. He restrains people from decisions or actions, as I noted in the beginning here. And we're going to look at the example of Abraham and his... Um, is talking to Abimelech, and I'm going to ask you to turn to chapter 20 in your Bibles. Chapter 20, and we see it in, in verse 1 of chapter 20, and we'll follow on down. It says, and Abraham journeyed from there to the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and stayed in Gerar. Now Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of, C uh, of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. So right from verse 2, we know that he took Sarah because he was under the impression that she was not married. Verse 3, but God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands, I have done this. Notice what verse 6 says. And God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet and he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. And I'm not gonna have us read the rest of the story, um, 
But notice that it says here very clearly that God kept Abimelech from touching her. Even before, it, this, this was after he had already taken her as his wife. And yet he had not yet done anything. He had not consummated that. And so um, the Lord said, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. So God did not physically or circumstantially restrain Abimelech. He restrained, he restrained him through his what? His mind or his dream. Okay. But not the dream, really. It wasn't the dream because that was after. This was before he had the dream. Because it says that Abimelech, the king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. He took her. But God came to him in a dream that night. And it was during that dream that he found out that she was his wife, Abraham's wife. And then, but he had not yet even touched her. And the Lord said, I am the one that kept you from doing that, even before this dream happened. So that conversation with Abimelech through the dream took place after God had already restrained him from touching Sarah. So God sovereignly intervened and protected the moral purity of Sarah, who was to be the mother of the promised son of Abraham. You know, God could have intervened circumstantially, but he didn't. He preserved Sarah's purity. I, said, I should have said he didn't at that time. He did later. But he chose to do so through moving in some way upon Abimelech's mind. And he restrained Abimelech through moving upon his will. Now, was, was Abimelech conscious of that restraining no, he wasn't. The scripture simply says that he had not gone near her. And so he chose of his own free will not to be uh, with Sarah, but his choosing was under the sovereign control of God. And this, this incident is even more amazing when we consider that Abraham had put Sarah in this difficult position through his own unbelief and sin. And God didn't, he, even though we don't see God necessarily confronting him over this, we know from scripture that he did not excuse Abraham's sin. But he didn't let it stop him from intervening in Abraham, Abimelech's mind to prevent the serious consequences of the sin. I want to take just a moment for us to think about this. And, and that is, what about God's sovereignty as it applied to Sarah? How should she have applied God's sovereignty to her situation? Or how, how did she or how should she? Were there any other possible routes for her to, to take, even though trusting in God's, God's sovereignty, that would have actually been an evidence of trusting in God's sovereignty? What else could she have done? Anything? Well, let me ask you this. What, what should Abraham have done? Okay. Yeah, so she joined in the deception. And he shouldn't have lied to Abimelech. Right, right. Yes, yes, so he, right. And as, as the husband, he should have been protecting her. That should have been his first priority rather than himself. And in, 
in protecting himself, he was leaving her vulnerable. And um, so he, he sinned against Sarah. And Sarah went along with it, trying to honor him. And um, in doing so, she put herself at peril. Is there anything else she could have done? What about making a, a respectful appeal to her husband, asking him to really to reconsider? And then uh, at, that, at the point at which, if that didn't help, if Abraham still wanted her to lie, she should have told him, I can't do that. I, I have to obey God because that was clearly sin. And, um, and you know, it's helpful when we, we think through those things. It's helpful when, you, we, when you're talking to your children. First of all, for us as adults to think through it, what else could she have done? What else should Abraham have done? And there, there are several things that could have been done. And yet they didn't. And as a result, they were put in a very precarious position, especially Sarah. He should have told Abimelech the truth. And yet in his mind, I believe he was probably justifying it because it was kind of, it kind of was the truth. But it was a deceptive truth because he knew that he was, she was his wife and, um, and he knew that that's what Abimelech would have been wanting to know as well. Now, can you imagine standing there watching another man take your wife? When you really think about what happened it's almost hard to imagine. It really is. So he was he watched Abimelech walk off with his wife. And that must have been very uh, very terrible feeling for her. She might have thought, well, if if I tell Abimelech that I'm Abraham's wife, he might kill him then. And that might have been a point of fear for her. But again, for both of them, it should have been a matter of faith. How was, was there any difference between Sarah's situation and Esther's situation? What? What? Well, Abimelech didn't. Well, he didn't have to. He was doing the motive of the thing. So in this particular case, it's just all evidence. So I don't want to get caught up in the fact that Sarah didn't have to do anything. She just did it. I agree. <laughs> However, back then the customs were a little different than they are today. And women were treated differently. And so we have... We have just the difference in customs in that way. And they were not as valued as they should be. Um, Did Sarah have some fear that she might get pregnant? I don't know about that, but I, I think even in that case, you would have to speak up and tell the truth. So I think it's, it's important to think through because Esther, Esther's whole, it wasn't a matter of deception. It was a matter of her going before the king and just pleading for the lives of her people. And, but she knew that her own life was in jeopardy 
and she, she was willing to lay down her life for her country and for those that were, she was close to as family members. So there, um, the only similarity is that they're, they could have both been laying down their lives. But Sarah chose not to, Abraham chose not to, and Abraham was the one who was most at fault in it all. All right. Um, yes, but he was, he was appealing to her because she was really the only one that could change what was going on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. She might have thought, though, that the king would not do that to her. And uh, she had not revealed her. I don't even know if Haman knew that she was a Jew. Did he know? I don't think so. No, she wasn't aware of the, until Mordecai came and told her, but I just, I don't know that Haman was aware that she was a Jew at that point. So, okay. I think it's good, though, to think through those situations and why, why it was different. Let's go to example two now, and that was two of Jacob's sons. And these were the two that had committed the heinous act of murdering the whole town because uh, their sister had been violated. And if you'll turn to Genesis 35... Genesis 35 and verse 1 and following, it says, Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of, your es of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you, purify yourselves and Change your garments, then let us arise and go to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree, which was by Shechem, and Shechem was the city uh, where the issue had happened. Verse 5, and they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan. So it's in chapter 34 that we have the issue taking place, and um, they didn't pursue them, even though they were, were few in number. Even though they had acted so cruelly, they had actually murdered everyone. Men, women, children, livestock, they didn't leave anything. And um, But it says that the terror of God was upon those cities that were around them and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. And that is amazing. And so, you know, when you think of terror or fear, that's something that usually is 
is um, induced by some external circumstance. And even though they killed the whole town, it was just two men that did it. And it's amazing that all the other surrounding cities did not come and deal with them because they had talked to them about it. So there was no reason for that other than for what it says, that God put that fear in them for their safety. And then the example three is King Darius and his decree that, that was of rebuilding the temple, that it should stop. And before King Darius issued his decree that the rebuilding of the temple was not to be stopped, but he, he even assisted from the royal treasury, the territorial governor and other officials who had questioned the authority of the Jews to rebuild the temple. And they could have stopped the rebuilding prog progress until word was received from the king, but they did not. Why? Well, the scriptures tell us in Ezra 5, 5, if you'll turn there, And it says, but the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews so that they could not make them cease till a report could go to Darius. Then a written answer was returned concerning this matter. And so the eye of God was watching over this whole matter. Now we know that there were several times where the people started building and then they had to stop. And the why God would give the, you know, would give, give the king or give the people favor in front of the king to start building. And then the next time they would have to stop. And that was obviously allowed by God as well. We don't know all that, but that's all within the sovereignty of God. That's all within his wisdom, and we, we are to accept that. And then example four, God's command that all the men were to appear before him three times a year in Jerusalem. Go back to Exodus 34, because this is a fascinating part, part of the story. Chapter 34, and we're going to look at verse 23 and following. It's, it's verse 23 and 24. Three times in the year, all your men shall appear before the Lord, the Lord God of Israel. For I will cast out the nations before you and enlarge your borders. Neither will any man covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in the year. Now what is, do you find anything really fascinating about that? Yes. And who always had to come to Jerusalem? All the men. That meant all the warriors, everything. And so for the time that they were in Jerusalem, the rest of the country was basically defenseless. And yet the Lord said that they won't even covet your land. And it, what he was calling them to do was to act in faith because it goes against human reason. It goes against, you know, if you were to ask the United States to do that. <laughs> so that there would be this one huge assembly of people that would also include all of the military. And the rest of the country was, there was no one there that could defend the country. That's what he was telling him to do. 
And he says, they will not even covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord. They won't be thinking, hey, let's take advantage of them while they're there. And the Lord would honor them. <clears throat> it was a matter of faith. He would honor them because they were willing to follow his command and to trust him in doing that. So along with the, that command, he promised them as a point of faith that no one would covet their land during those times when they were utterly defenseless. Now, think about also the matter of covetousness. Covetousness is probably one of the most common and powerful desires of sinful man. It's, it's deeply rooted in the heart. Um, even Adam and Eve, I mean, when Eve sinned, she, she coveted the apple because it would give her the knowledge of God, she thought. And you have the Apostle Paul, who is a Pharisee, could speak of his faultless outward observance of God's law. But in Romans chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, he describes as though talking about himself, how would I have known coveting unless the law said, thou shalt not covet? And he was acknowledging that he was guilty of that. He could refrain himself from stealing, but not from coveting. Yet God said that no other nation would covet the land of the Israelites, even during that vulnerable time. And I think it shows us that God can restrain not only people's actions, but even their most deeply rooted desires. No part of the human heart is impervious or impenetrable to God's sovereign, mysterious control. We've used a number of illustrations from Scripture over this whole study to document that God does move in hearts of people, either positively or to cause, to cause them to do God's will, or negatively to restrain them from doing what is contrary to his will. And that's important that we, we believe that and we understand it. We need to read these accounts um, for what they are. They're biblical history that is given to us so that we will apply it to our lives and in our situations. And as Romans 15, 4 says, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So all the examples we've looked at so far are there to teach us that we can trust God in all circumstances. Let's look at Roman numeral two. God does permit evil. And we all know that. One of the examples was in the rebuilding of the temple, and I'd like you to turn to Ezra again. Ezra chapter 4. Starting in verse 6. And it it goes on through verse 24. It says, In the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. In the days of Artaxerxes also, Bishlam, Mithridath, Tabal, and the rest of their companies, companions, wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia, and the letter was written in Aramaic script and translated into Aramaic language. And... Uh, the letter against Jerusalem to King Artaxerxes was in this fashion. From Rahim, the commander, I'll skip all the, um, <laughs> the names, and the rest of the nations, verse 10, whom the great and noble Onapur took captive and settled in the cities of Samaria and the remainder beyond the river and so forth. This is a copy of the letter that went, 
that they sent him to King Artaxerxes from your servants, the men of the region beyond the river, and so forth. Let it be known to the king that the Jews who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem and are building the rebellious and evil city and are finishing its walls. And verse 16, he says, we inform the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls are completed, the result will be that you will have no dominion beyond the river. The king sent an answer to Rehum, the commander, to Shimshai, the scribe, to the rest of their companions who dwell in Samaria and to the remainder beyond the river. The letter which you sent to us has been clearly read before me and I gave the command and a search has been made and it was found that this city in former times has revolted against kings and rebellion and sedition have been fostered in it. There, there have also been mighty kings over Jerusalem who have ruled over all the region beyond the river and tax, tribute, and custom were paid to them. Now give the command to make these men cease that this city may not be built until the command is given by me. Take heed now that you do not fail to do this. Why should damage increase to the herd of the kings? Now when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum, Shimshai, the scribe, and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews and by force of arms made them cease. Thus the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased, and it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So there was a, a period of around 10 years when the project was stopped due to opposition from the enemies of the Jews. So why did a king, why did God move in a king's heart to send Jews back to Israel and begin building the temple only to have it stopped in the middle and allow the enemies of God to prevail? And it's, it's enough to know that God restrains, God does restrain the harmful acts of others toward us when that is his sovereign will. And Furthermore, God in his infinite wisdom and love intends that good ultimately come from those harmful acts. And we know though that later on then it was that they got approval to begin again and they did. And the temple was completed and dedicated. God was teaching them again of his timing and teaching them to wait on his timing. Look at example two, and we know this one very well. When Joseph's brothers decided to sell him into slavery, God did not restrain them from doing that. And he didn't restrain Potiphar's wife when she maliciously and unjustly accused him. We know the end of the story. We know that in time, he turned those circumstances around and God was orchestrating those acts of wickedness that people did against them and he planned it in order to accomplish his purpose through Joseph. And even Joseph, as he looked back at the events, he said the Lord did this. He wasn't bitter toward his family members, his brothers. He, he didn't even show any bitterness towards Potiphar or Potiphar's wife. He could look back and he said, you intended it to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving, saving of many lives. And it reminded me of the verse in James where it says, but let patience have its what? Its perfect work. It does. It goes on and it says um, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And the word perfect is this, those, it's used twice and it means the same thing. But in one, the implication is more, let your, uh, but let patience have its perfect work, its completing work. That word perfect, uh, the Greek word actually means 
bring to full maturity, which has the idea of a, uh, you know, bringing a, a young a child to full manhood. There's a preacher that um, said this, Joseph's brothers devise and execute their plans Aroused by jealousy, they, they gradually commit themselves irrevocable, irrevocably to their chosen course. Their evil plan achieves historical realization, but the historical events are products of the divine activity. God, God's good intents follow the mischievous path of the brothers, or rather, the brothers unwittingly follow the path that God has blazed their work in his service. They work in his service. The purpose of God lights up the horizon of evil, jealousy, malicious activity, by meaning it, it illuminates. He was, Joseph was illuminated when he looked back and he saw that this was God's plan all the time for, for saving his own family, not just Egypt. And then another commentator said this, from the history of Joseph, we may see that the same things may be from man in one point of view and from God in another. And that what man may do sinfully to the injury of the people of God, God may effect through them for the good of his people. It is man's work, yet it is, in another view, God's work. I... Um, Several years ago, I was reading a book by Spurgeon, and it's called An All-Round Ministry. It's, it was actually rich, written to his seminary students or his college students. And I believe this is one of the best um, quotations I've ever read on the sovereignty of God. But just listen to it. It's a little longer, but it's worth, worth listening to. He said, faith leads us to believe in difficulties being overruled to promote success. Because we believe in God, that's that faith again that he mentioned, because we believe in God and in his Holy Spirit, we believe that difficulties will be greatly sanctified to us, that they are only placed before us as stepping stones to grander results. Do you know of another... Another, uh, it's a hymn that we sing that talks about our trials being sanctified to us. Do you, do you remember where that is? It's in How Firm a Foundation. And he uses that same term. We believe in defeats, my brethren. We believe in going back with the banner trailed in the mire persuaded that this may be the surest way to lasting triumph. We believe in waiting, weeping, agonizing. We believe in a non-success which prepares us for doing greater and higher works for which we should not have been fitted unless anguish had sharpened our soul. We believe in our infirmities and even glory in them. We thank God that we are not so eloquent as we could wish to be and have not all the abilities we might desire because now we know that the excellency of the power shall be of God and not of us. Faith enables us to rejoice in the Lord that our infirmities become platforms for the display of his grace. Brethren, we believe that even our enemies shall in God's hands subserve our highest interests. They are yoked to the car of God. Perhaps of all the powers which affect the divine purposes in the world, no one does more than the devil himself. He is but a scullion in the eternal's kitchen, and a scullion was just a, a servant who scrubbed the floors and did the housework. He is but a scullion in the eternal's kitchen. He unwittingly performs much work to which the Lord would not put his own children, work which is just as needful as that which seraphim perform. Believe not that evil is a rival power of equal potency with the good God. 
No, sin and death are like the Gibeonites, hewers of wood and drawers of water for the divine purposes. And though they know it not, when the Lord's enemies rave and rage most, they fulfill his eternal purposes to the praise of the glory of his wisdom and grace. It's, it's, a, it's a quotation that you would do well to meditate on, especially in a time of trial. And then sometimes, according to the Bible, God even moves in the hearts of some people to act stubbornly. For instance, in Deuteronomy 2, verse, chapter 2, verse 30, talking about Sihon, king of Heshbon, which they overcame and they destroyed right before they entered the land of, of Israel. And it says this, but Sion, king of Heshbon, refused to let us pass through. For the Lord your God had made his spirit stubborn and his heart obstinate in order to give him into your hands as he has now done. And then it says in Joshua eleven twenty. For it was the Lord himself who hardened their hearts to wage over against Israel so that he might destroy them totally, exterminating them without mercy as the Lord had commanded Moses. Now, up to this point, our purpose really has not been to solve some of the problems that people typically um, bring up in regards to sovereignty. We're going to do that, but we're not going to take that time tonight. I'm going to save the rest for next week and so that we have plenty of time to pray. And um, we have a number of uh, prayer letters from our missionaries as well. So we'll finish that next week. All right. So if you could lay that aside and we'll do that. I'll mark my sheet so I remember. Okay, if you'll take out your prayer sheet. 